you were seeing women outside of your marriage while you were married, correct? I don't know. What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts. My name is Spidey and I use my degree in sociology and psychology, my certifications in criminal interrogation and body language analysis, and over 10 years experience as an award-winning mentalist to teach people behavioral analysis and practical psychology on stages and television shows all over the world. This week we are looking at a story that has been all over the news for the last couple of days concerning Donald Trump, the 45th President of the United States, real estate mogul, and this week on trial. And we're going to look at all the details of what the trial is, who sued him, and at the time that we're filming this video, the verdict is in, so we'll talk about what that is and what it reflects. But above all things, we're going to look at his body language, his facial expressions, and his word choice to see what they reflect about the way he's feeling and what he's thinking throughout his deposition that was made public just last week. Now, as I was looking at this deposition, I had a lot of legal questions about the details, about the complaint, and some of the things I'm seeing throughout this deposition. So I wanted to bring in someone to give us the legal perspective. So my guest today is someone that a lot of you are very familiar with. I think he's been on this channel more often than I've been on this channel, and he's here to offer us the legal perspective, which I value enormously. So everyone, welcome to the channel. My good friend, Rob from Law & Lumber. What's up, dude? Hey, Spotty, how's it going? Good, man. I know you're really excited to jump into this case. Oh. So, well, there's, there's, that's, that's a word for it. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, why don't you, uh, in a nutshell, tell us what this case is about. And at the time that we're recording this video, a verdict has been reached. Why don't you give us a really quick from beginning to end details? Go. Okay. So today we're talking about a case that was filed in November 24th of 2022. The case is filed in the Southern District of New York, United States District Court, E. Jean Carroll versus Donald J. Trump. Now, the allegations stem from 95 and 96 when E. Jean Carroll alleges that at Bergdorf Goodman in New York, Mr. Donald Trump engaged in an act of essay and the grander word R uh, while in the store. Now, this did not get reported at the time, but Ms. Carroll went out and published a book in 2017 after the 2016 election in which this particular incident came up and she engaged in some speaking engagements to that regard. Former President Trump denied that these events took place, went a few steps further as well, and that resulted in this lawsuit being filed. The complaint boils down to two counts. One, battery, unlawful touching of another person. Two, defamation. E. Jean Carroll says it happened. Donald J. Trump said it didn't happen and said that she was a liar and was trying to grift off of, his, off of, the, off of the false statement that she was making. Jury came back. Jury said that there was a battery, might not have been the grand R, but there was a battery and that Donald J. Trump defamed her. So he was found liable for some of the battery, but not all of it. This one was a bit unique because that first count, so he was found liable under both counts of the complaint, but that first count received three separate jury instructions. One was that he did the R word, the other one was the SA word, and the other one was forcible touching. The jury said no to the R word, yes to the SA word. And because they said yes to the SA word, they weren't required to reach the third one. So it wasn't a clean sweep, but it was a pretty overwhelming victory for Ms. Carroll. Now, Rob, before we jump into these clips and look at this deposition and what the behaviors are telling us from a behavioral and legal standpoint, there was a condition that you made me agree to before you accepted being part of this video. Why don't you tell everyone what that condition was and why it's so important to you? Yeah, so I've been a domestic relations practitioner for more than a decade, and I've seen these cases play out uh, with accusations from both sides. This is even more complex in a case where you've been, where it's been filed and litigated in district court and federal court, where we don't have eyes on screen. We can't watch what the jury is seeing. So we are seeing a snapshot from one person's perspective of what might have occurred that day. Accusations of this nature are remarkably severe. People have intense emotions, recollections, factual interpretations surrounding this particular topic. I want to be very, very, very clear here. I'm not opining as to what, whether something did or did not occur. I'm giving my analysis of a single deposition that is essentially one grain of sand amidst an entire desert. So basically, in sum, my, my caveat here was that we can talk about every single element of this deposition, but I'm not going to reach that grander issue of whether this did or did not occur. And Spidey, you might want to elaborate on this one further, 
but in my experience, when we're talking about a deposition for events that took place more than 20 years ago, there are going to be some gaps in memory. There are going to be some things that just are left unexplained. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. 100%. And thanks for bringing that up. I talk about this in every case that we look at where a certain amount of time has passed, things that aren't in the last couple of years, because research has shown again and again and again that with time, testimony is not reliable. And we're going to look at even some signs in this deposition that he doesn't remember things surrounding this as well. So we're going to get that. And because this is so high stakes and such a serious accusation, I think what you're saying makes perfect sense. Okay, okay, just one last thing before we actually dive in. Uh, and this is a really important message from Rob and I. And it's the fact that there are people watching this video who really don't like Donald Trump. There are people watching this video who really like Donald Trump. Whatever your conclusions are, however you got to those conclusions, they are valid. We don't all have to agree, but we further, do have to just because each we other. like someone, it doesn't make them innocent of everything. And just because we dislike someone doesn't make them guilty of everything. We have to be able to look at specific things objectively, like this deposition, regardless of everything else that surrounds it. So Rob and I are not morality analysts. We are not political analysts. We are a legal and a behavioral analyst. And we are going to be looking at this deposition through those lens. We are not interested in attacking or defending anybody. And if you find that offensive, if you think that there should be an attack or that there should be a defense in this, I think you should consider sitting this video out and I'll see you next week. At some point, uh, you became the owner of the Plaza Hotel in New York, correct? Yes. And where's the Plaza Hotel located? 59th off Fifth Avenue. And um, for how long were you the owner withdrawn? During what years were you the owner of the Plaza Hotel? I don't know the years, about five years. And do you know when it began, when you bought it? Uh, in the early, early 90s. Okay. Now, in the 80s and 90s, is it fair to say you had a, a busy social life? I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know what you, you'd have to define social life. I wouldn't say uh, that busy. I was working very hard, so I didn't have time to be too much onto the social calendar, but yeah. Well, let me, let me try to phrase it this way. In the evenings during that period, you went out quite a bit in New York City to benefits, galas, etc. A lot of charity events, yes, uh, but I don't think that much, no. So, Spidey, this... This clip is an example of, of Donald J. Trump's baseline. And one of the things that I noticed in his baseline is this thing that might seem deceptive. It's his intent to regain control of the questions. He takes the question from the questioner, reframes it, pauses, and then spits it back, not directly verbatim from what the questioner stated, but with his own little twist. That is very baseline for Donald J. Trump. I was wondering if you saw anything else beyond that. Oh yeah, so this, this is exactly why this clip is here. It allows us to get a baseline of him. And, and I wanna elaborate on what you're saying. It sounds deceptive, but it's part of his baseline. So this is why we look at baseline, right? So if we have someone who's just answering direct questions and then you ask a specific question, all of a sudden they're like reframing and thinking about things. And we're gonna look at some other baseline behaviors he has here. You would go, oh, wait a second, something's different there. But for him, a lot of these behaviors that for someone else might be like, oh, wait a second, for him, are just part of the way he communicates. So first of all, let's talk about how he answers questions. When the question is asked, there's a moment of hesitation or thought for him to get the answer. And while this is happening, his eyes are either looking straight in front of him or to his right or in this area. And he thinks about his answer. And we often see things with the mouth. We're gonna to get to that in a second. But we see him thinking about the answer. And often when he gets to the answer, we see this lean towards her with the shoulder leading. So he leans towards her, looks at her and answers the question. So asked, think about it, lean and answer. So this is the choreography we're seeing for his answers. There's also a difference in the way he answers questions that are fact and questions that are opinion. Whenever it's fact, like you bought the plaza, it's yes, he just answers the question. When it's opinion-based, we very often see a shrug before the answer. And sometimes it's just the mouth going like this. And sometimes it's both shoulders going like this. He shrugs before the answer. And this is him kind of like taking a second to not necessarily, 
It's the nonverbal way of him saying, I don't necessarily agree. Because if we look at the research on shrugging, it denotes, I don't something. And I have a whole video about this on the channel, the science behind this, the research that allows us to know this. I'll leave the link in the description. But shrugging is, I don't something. I don't care. I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I don't have anything to add. You know, you might go like this, like, yeah, I don't have anything to add. So in his case, it's, I don't necessarily agree. Let me think about my opinion on this before I agree or disagree. To add to that, the next thing that's part of his baseline, and we're going to see this a lot throughout this deposition, is answers that if you strip of all the context and look at what the answer is, the answer comes down to a yes, but no, no, but yes. And we saw it here, right? He was asked if he had a very active social life. And he said, uh, I was very busy. So, you know, I didn't really have time, but yeah. So no, but yeah. Then she asks again and he says, well, you know, there were a lot of charity events, but I don't think that much. So now we have a yes, but no. So it's almost like he enjoys playing with levels of specificity. So there are sometimes answers where he gives a lot of ambiguity like this. I legitimately don't know based on his answer if he went to a lot of events or not back then because he said no, but yes, yes, but no. But then there are other things that he over explains, things that don't need explaining. And he goes into a lot of detail and explains a lot. And again, not just in his deposition, but this is baseline for him. So we have fluctuating levels of detail depending on the question and how much he feels like giving away in that statement. Now, I do also want to talk about what's different behaviorally here from the Donald Trump that we're used to. So you'll notice almost immediately that he's a bit calmer here than usual. Usually he illustrates a lot when he talks. We see this kind of thing a lot with the hands. This is very Donald Trump. The hands come to life as he speaks. And this is when he's rallying or when he's giving speeches to his crowd and his tone is higher. This is what he does when he's trying to get people riled up. In this case, he's not. He's just sitting there. He's answering questions. His body language is a little more closed. You'll notice his head is down. His shoulders are up. We call this turtling when we're trying to make ourselves a little bit smaller. I think he's not as, I mean, obviously he's not as excited about this conversation, but there's a calmness here. He's less animated, more calm and more kind of centered in this interview than normally. At least in your first marriage, you were seeing women outside of your marriage while you were married, correct? I don't know. Well, you were very public about the fact that you were seeing Ms. Maples when you were still married to Ms. to Ivana Trump, no? No, I don't think I was public about it. Well, there were a lot, well, there were many, many articles about it at the time, correct? No, I don't think I was public about it. But if, uh, uh, no, I don't think I was public about it at all. Yeah, isn't it true that you were seeing Ms. Maples before you were divorced from Ivana Trump? I don't know. It's, uh, it was toward the end of the marriage. Uh, so I don't know, really. I, it could be, a, it could be a lap over, but I don't really know. Did you ever have occasion to go uh, to the department store Bergdorf Goodman? Very rarely. When you say very rarely. Can you give me more detail? How rarely? I mean, I, almost, for me, almost never. I would very rarely go there. When you went there, what do you recall shopping for? I don't know. It's possible I, I was there, but I don't know that I ever shopped there for myself. All right, so important note on this one. Um, throughout the clips we're using here, sometimes there are cuts where I cut certain things out to, to keep the stuff that we're commenting on, but there are also sometimes cuts in the deposition. And that was one of them. So. He's asked about infidelity and we hear something. We hear somebody say something and then it cuts to him saying, I don't know. And my feeling on this was it was cut because maybe something was said or interrupted. But then Rob, this is why I wanted you here. How do these depositions work? Is there someone there, a judge or something that says, no, you can't ask that or kind of tries to, you know, regulate certain things. How does this work? So I'm glad you asked and I'm glad it's, it's early on. Depositions are the Wild West. There's no judge there. It's attorney versus attorney, and there's one person who's subjected to questioning under oath. The attorneys have the opportunity to interject objections along the way. They can say objection calls for speculation, objection to the form of the question. As phrased, the question asks this person to speculate. 
And it's up to the other attorney to instruct the witness to continue answering the question, unless the attorney that made the objection says, you should not answer. I am instructing you not to answer. Only then, when there's a stalemate between the two attorneys, that's why I said it's the Wild West, does a phone call get made to a judge to make a ruling on a specific objection? And there are judges that will sit duty bench in the afternoons to hear over these little, for lack of a better term, pissing matches between attorneys uh, on whether or not the answer should be given. So what you're hearing is actually just a stitched edit. So this was an objection that was ruled upon at some point in time by a judge, and that resulted in a portion of the deposition transcript and the video being snipped out. Now, behaviorally speaking, I'm gonna turn this over to you pretty quick because there wasn't a whole lot that I caught here, but what I did catch was a lot of dodging questions for sport. It seemed <laughs> like, it really did seem like he knew that the questioner knew that there was infidelity going on. And he just wasn't going to give her the satisfaction of giving her an up and down answer and was just dodging the question. Yeah, and what's crazy about it is, so, so okay, let's take it from the top. Earlier we talked about how he has a way he answers questions that are fact, yes or no, just yes or no. And here, when he was asked about the infidelity and a portion was cut, we come back, pout with the lips, and he goes, I don't know. Outside of your marriage, while you were married, correct? I don't know. If I cheated on my wife back then. So then she goes on to say, you've been pretty public about that. And look at his focus. For me, the part that someone focuses on in a question is very important. He doesn't say it didn't happen. Three times he says, I, I, don't, I don't think I was public about it. I don't, I don't think I was public about it. There is a word that gets thrown around a lot when it comes to Donald Trump. And that word is narcissist. Now, at the time that we're recording this video, I'm not aware of any psychiatrist or psychologist that has had the opportunity to examine him one-on-one -on -one and determine that he has NPD, Diagnosed Narcissistic Personality Disorder. I'm not aware of that. So let's put the clinical diagnosis off the table. However, behaviorally, I think we can all agree that to some degree, he displays certain narcissistic behaviors. So. There's an acronym for narcissism that spells out special me. And I love it because it's such a great way to remember it. And I'm gonna put it up on the screen right now. And as we go through this, I'm not saying it's a 10 on 10 for every single one of these, but whether you support the guy, whether you don't support the guy. Rob, would you agree that it's safe to say that to varying degrees, some of these apply to his behavior? Mm-hmm. Yes, and about 99.9% .9 of all politicians throughout all of history. Special me. Look, me special, special me. So again, when I say narcissist, I mean as a behavior, not a diagnosis. But someone who has certain narcissistic traits, when you criticize them about something, they have a very hard time moving past that criticism. When he's being told, you were public about this, and that part, he's going, no, I was actually quite good at hiding that. So that's, bug that's where he's stuck. It's not whether the affair happened or not, it's no, I wasn't public about it three times. Both times where he gets asked flat out if he cheated on his wife, we see a pacifier or adapter. It's basically two words for the same thing. There's a lot of literature, a lot of research on this. They're called pacifiers, adapters, self-soothing gestures. Basically, it's gestures that we do to calm ourselves down and very often they are repetitive in nature. And with him, he's got his arm like this and both times, we're seeing that thumb start to pacify. This is just him trying to adjust for the stress he's feeling of trying to answer this question. But at the end of the day, he says, I don't know. So going back to your point, Rob, um, it almost doesn't serve him to dodge this question. Now, granted, I don't know what I would say because you're put on the spot. The lawyer is asking you to cheat on your wife. The answer to that is probably yes, but he may not want to admit that openly during this deposition because it paints him under a certain light and the jury's going to see this footage and you know be like okay so this is the type of person that we're dealing with but i don't know that the answer i don't know helps his cause anymore because the jury's going to look at that and some of them are going to go well no you're lying you know you must have cheated and then other jury members are going to look at it and go how can you not know you know it's almost like if you don't know it's because you've done it so often that you can't remember if you did it in this specific case so it just goes back to a yes so it's a really difficult question for anybody to answer under deposition but 
I'm not quite certain what other options he would have had. There aren't a whole lot. Like I said before, even when objection is made, the answer is given. So not much. But for that second part of the question, Rob, I agree with you 100%. When he's being asked about Bergdorf Goodman and he's saying, you know, I've, I've rarely been there, almost never been there. I, I don't know if I shopped for myself. I didn't shop for myself. I can't remember. There's this, again, this yes, but no, no, but yes, up and down. It's very unclear. He can't remember. And for me, it goes right back to what we we're discussing before, the fallacy of memory. He is admittedly here saying that he can't even remember, you know, how often he's been there, if he was, what he bought, who he was there with. He's claiming he can't remember if he cheated on his wife, it was before the end of the marriage, after the end of the marriage. He's admitting to have these, all these flaws in his memory, but then he's going to go on to say with certainty that he's never met this woman, that she completely made up the fact that they met at Bergdorf Goodman. But it's a slippery slope to argue that when you don't seem to be very certain about how often you've been to this store and in what context. So listen, is it possible that he really can't remember because you know, he's in New York, he's a busy guy, he's been to a lot of department stores, probably with his wives, probably wasn't paying attention. So is it possible that he literally can't remember how often he's been there? I'd say it's possible. Again, I know the flaws of memory. It's possible that it's all just one big blur. But to go from that to the certainty that it's a complete lie that he bumped into this woman at Bergdorf Goodman, it's a harder case for him to defend. I don't know if legally that, that stands what I just said. It does. And Rob, that's a great question for you. As a lawyer, is this something you would bring up? So later in this deposition, when he says like, she's lying about us meeting at Bergdorf Goodman, that didn't happen. Would you bring up and say, with all due respect, sir, you know, earlier you didn't seem clear at all on how many times you've been to the store and in what context. Now you seem very certain that you never met her there. Is it possible that you may have? in all those visits and you don't remember, would you would you push on that? I would, because I would see that there would be something deceptive about the previous answer in light of the, the new answer. But then I also might keep that in my back pocket and just argue that point to the jury. Point out that inconsistency to the jury rather than allow the witness the opportunity to correct themselves. If you point it out to the jury, they might go, oh my God, that, you know, there's an inconsistency there. Exactly. Um, I'll say it with great respect. Number one, she's not my type. Number two, it never happened. It never happened, okay? And then the reporters say, the president said, said while well, seated behind the Resolute desk in the Oval Office. When you said that Ms. Carroll was not your type, you meant that she was not your type physically, right? Physically, she's not my type. And now that I've gotten indirectly to hear things about her, she wouldn't be my type in any way, shape, or form. Spidey, what, what are you wearing? Oh, this, this is, uh, I'm getting ready to protect myself from the comments that are about to rain upon us. I've heard that woolly mammoth tusks are very good at deflecting polarizing comments. Uh, sure, whatever works, sure. <laughs> so Rob, we're gonna hear this argument quite a bit, uh, that she's not my type. He says this a lot throughout this, and we're gonna see other clips where he, where he focuses on that. And for the viewers, I just want you to put a pin in that. The fact that he keeps saying, physically she's not his type so so just keep that in mind but rob i just want to know as an attorney who's dealt with this a lot because i can look at this and have an emotional response to that but as an attorney i'm asking you is that an adequate defense for sa she's not my type and i'm not saying it's necessarily being presented as a defense but as an attorney who deals with this kind of thing do you accept it as a defense for sa or that kind of thing well, not only do I not accept it, but the law doesn't accept it as a defense. So the law does not recognize they're not my type as a defense to accusations of SA. And honestly, here, it's a bit confusing as to what he's... I feel like we're almost witnessing some internal monologue, just a little bit of dialogue that he's having in the back of his head, like, of course this didn't happen, she's not my type. But so very rarely does this, this actually get voiced, especially in situations this serious. So I, I was kind of taken aback when, when I first saw this little clip. I think that's exactly what it is. I don't think it's being presented as a legal defense. It's just him going like, why would I do this? She's not even my type. Further, I want to talk about 
the way we order things. So I've talked about this on the channel numerous times. It's very normal in a setting where I'm trying to persuade you to something to build towards the biggest thing last. But when we list things with numbers and we say number one this, number two that, number three this, we start with the most important because it's literally number one. For me, it was interesting to say the least that his number one is she's not my type. And then number two is it never happened. That number one isn't it didn't happen. Wasn't there, it didn't happen. That's number one. So in his head, she's not my type outweighs and is more important than number two. It didn't happen. It never happened. So on the one hand, we have a denial. We have a direct denial. And it's good to see that. You know, like whenever you're talking to someone about something and they're denying it, you want to get that direct denial. It didn't happen. So it's nice that that's there. But that's not number one. Number one is she's not my type. So going back to what we we're talking about, I think what he's saying in this moment is that, yeah, this didn't happen. I never bumped into her. None of this happened. But more so than that, she's not my type. So this would never happen. This isn't in the realm of possibilities that would happen because she's not my type. And I think because he has that grandiose sense of self, that focus on self, I think to him, she's not my type is a very strong argument. Because she's not his type, this cannot happen. That's the end of it. Does that make sense? It does, actually. And to add on to the point that you just made, the statements that form the base of the defamation complaint uh, one of them was June 21st, 2019. And in that one, that was just an emphatic denial of the accusations. It wasn't until three days later on June 24th of 2019 that he actually throws in the added statement of it wouldn't happen. She's not my type. So the written statement that came out, organized, methodical, didn't happen three days later, not my type. Deposition, different. I have in front of you a black and white photograph that we've marked as DJT23. And I'm going to ask you, is this the photo that you were just referring to? I think so, yes. Okay. And do you recall when you first saw this photo? At some point during the process, I saw it. That's, uh, I guess, her husband, John Johnson, who was an anchor for ABC. Nice guy, I thought. I mean, I don't know him, but I thought he was pretty good at what he did. Um, I don't even know who the woman, let's see, I don't know who, th it's Marla. You say Marla's in this photo? That's Marla, yeah, that's, that's my wife. Which wo woman are you pointing to? No. That's Here. Carol. Oh, is that, the oh, person okay. you just pointed to was oh, Eugene Carroll. Who is that? Who is this? And the person, the woman on the right is your then wife, I don't Ivana? know, this was the picture. Ivana. I assume that's John Johnson. Is that that's Carol? Because Carol? it's very blurry. <sighs> Rob, ready for the comments? Bring it on. Spidey, did he just identify E. Jean Carroll as the person that was his wife? Yup. His his lawyer almost like jumps in really quick. Goes, no, that, that, that's her. That's that's uh, E. Jean Carroll. And then the opposing lawyer says loud and clear, the person you just pointed to was E. Jean Carroll. Because Rob, I would imagine in this moment, she understands what this means for her case. The fact that he's said numerous times, this woman's not my type, and now he's pointing to her and saying, that's my wife. Yep, and you hear a bunch of people chime in at the same time, trying to either muddy the transcript or make the point. And this is kind of why I go back to that first statement I made earlier. Depositions are the wild, wild west. Everyone is getting in word in edgewise to try and make this either muddier or more clear. If I'm plaintiff's counsel in this deposition, I'm pretty pleased because I have Donald Trump in previous questioning going on effusively as to how this woman that's suing him, E. Jean Carroll, is not his type. And he's just identified someone that being E. Jean Carroll as being his wife, someone that I'm pretty sure he doesn't find to be unattractive. So he's pretty much put a foot in his own mouth and kind of shot a hole in his own argument. Spidey, I don't know if you caught anything either before, during, or after that that you wanted to elaborate on. 
Yeah, let's talk about behaviorally what happens after that. So, so he fumbles, and I think it's pretty clear to anyone that this pokes a hole in his argument that she's not his type because he confused her, like you said, for someone that at the very least he's not repulsed by, his wife, right? It would be a difficult argument to make that his wife isn't his type. Um, the moment that happens though, look at, look at what he says. He starts listing things he's certain of because there's this fumble and he goes, oh no, we got to get off this. So I'm just going to start saying things I'm certain of. So he says, that was the picture. And that's complete filler. That's an unnecessary sentence. We know it's a picture. Like I know facts. Like I may have fumbled that, but I know things. That was the picture. Then he says, I, I assume that's John Johnson. Whereas he previously, I mean, he knows it's John Johnson. He was very sure about that. But now he's kind of just reiterating things that he knows to kind of get off this thing that he didn't know. Because he knows for him, the way he thinks is, it's not a good look that I didn't know this. Let me just start listing facts, things that I do know. The woman on the right is your then wife, I don't Ivana? know. This was the picture. Ivana. I assume that's John Johnson. Is that that's Carol? Because it's very blurry. And then he says, it's very blurry. Something that, first off, he didn't say until this moment. So it's a justification as to why he would have messed it up. And second, that I personally disagree with. Rob, is that something that you would describe as a blurry photo? No, not yeah, based on the I, image I, I saw. It's, it's black and white, it's not HD, but I wouldn't describe it as blurry. Let me put it this way. If that was a photograph of me, some guy, and my girlfriend, I guarantee you with that resolution, I would be able to identify whether it's my girlfriend or a woman that I've said that is not my type at all. But Rob, here's my question about this because I do want to kind of go back and forth a little bit. Why hasn't he studied this photo in more depth? I mean, this photo is, is very important to this case because it's disproving the fact that he never met her. His claim was, I've never met this woman. And it seems to me that someone who would be riddled in guilt, prepared to go into a deposition and is going to be asked hard questions would really want to have an ironclad story. And they would take this photograph that holds a lot of value and would really study it and get ready to answer questions about it. How is it possible that he doesn't know much about this photo? Spidey, I, I wish I had an answer for you other than I don't know. The frustration that you're describing, the confusion you're, what you're describing, is something that I mirror in this moment. When I have clients going in for depositions, I review everything with them. They usually have exhibit binders the whole week before the depot to review them with instructions. Then I, then I question them to prepare them for it. I don't know how this happened. It's almost like to me, this is an indication that he's not taking this too seriously. And for me, that can have, you know, we're talking about being objective. You can objectively look at that as having two meanings. One is he's above it. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about this case. You know, she showed up to trial, he didn't. So you can look at it that way, or you can look at it as he does believe fundamentally that this didn't happen, he didn't do this, and he doesn't feel the need to study everything because he's just gonna answer questions. He thinks this didn't happen. If he's just honest about it, you know, the truth is gonna come out. Maybe, so you can look at that, his lack of preparedness as either of those two things. Am I wrong? No, I think you're pretty spot on. It's, this could be viewed any which way. I'm just confused. Same. I take it the three women you've married are all your type. Yeah. What is true social? Okay, Rob, so at first I was curious as to why that cut was there, because that's not my cut. And I was like, okay, he's asking if his wives are his type, and he says, yeah, and it, and it cuts. But then I noticed that when it cuts, the color grading is entirely different. And I looked at the timestamp and that's not just a couple of seconds, that's like an hour and a half is gone. So I'm guessing they went to lunch or something, but it was still a little abrupt the way it ended. I would assume your wives are your type. Yeah, that's it, lunch, it's, it's lunchtime, let's go. Um, and given the fact that that question is I think a very smart question because it eliminates a possibility from our minds, I just want to know what your thoughts were on that question, that cut, whatever, thoughts, go. Yeah, of course. So these depositions have a timeline to them and the attorneys try to prepare their questions in the line with that timeline, right? There's a certain set of questions and topics they want to cover before lunch or before any particular break. And they don't want the, they don't want the witness to be free to consider their answers 
before they continue with the questions. This is a question I imagine that she circled when he gave that answer with regard to the photograph or someone passed to her on her desk because she came back right before the conclusion of the pre-lunch portion of the depot. So this is pretty good lawyering on her part. Now, this question kind of closes the loop on something that might have been left open-ended. He misidentified E. Jean Carroll as the person he believed was his wife. Connect that with his prior statement of, you know, she's not my type. Now the question is, well, is your wife your type? Because the misidentification, that particular issue. So she just made sure that that wiggle room wasn't available to him to be used further down the road. I don't even think that it's not available to him. I think it's also not available to us for us to go and hold on a second. Maybe his wife isn't particularly his type. But now by asking that, we go, okay, so his wife is his type. Uh, e. Jean Carroll is not. So why would he have confused the two in a photograph? Close all the doors you can. She completely made up a story that I met her at the doors of this crowded New York City department store and within minutes swooned her. It is a hoax and a lie, just like all the other hoaxes that have been played on me for the past seven years. And while I'm not supposed to say it, I will. This woman is not my type, exclamation point. She has no idea what day, what week, what month, what year, or what decade this so-called event, in quotes, supposedly took place. The reason she doesn't know is because it never happened. Now all I have to do is go through years more of legal nonsense in order to clear my name of her and her lawyer's phony attacks on me. This can only happen to, quote, in quotes, Trump, exclamation point. That, did I read that correctly? Great statement. Yeah. Um, and True. now that you've heard it again and you have it in front of you, you're again confirmed that you wrote the whole thing yourself. I wrote it all myself. Okay, so there's a couple of things with the body language here that I wanted to highlight before I pass it over to you, Rob. So when we're talking about his narcissism as a behavior, some traits that we're seeing, there's a few that are coming through over here. First of all, when that not my type thing comes up again, we see this kind of little bit of a pop and he looks over to his lawyer. He's, he's laughing at his own statement there. Like he is amused by himself in that moment. Uh, it's just a little, a tiny little chuckle there at like, she's not my type. He's like, got him. Like, he's proud of himself. As soon as the reading ends, he goes, great statement. Like, he says that about his own statement. Great statement. Pat on the back. Great statement. True, true, great statement. Again, he's proud of himself. He's proud of this statement. And then I want you to pay attention to when he's asked if he wrote it himself. And he goes, I wrote it all myself. And we see this gesture, this no gesture. Now, this, I talk about a lot in the videos, is one of the gestures that has the most misconceptions out there when it comes to body language. We see it in all kinds of like articles and magazines and even in my own comments. People go, when someone's saying something and you see this gesture, they're lying. They don't agree with what they're saying. So there isn't a single gesture that can allow you to know when someone is being deceptive. Least of all, this gesture. This gesture doesn't always mean disagreement with what I'm saying. It can. But this gesture socially often comes down to one of four things and they all start with D-I-S, this. So it's disbelief, disapproval, disappointment, or disagreement. So notice how sometimes I might eat something really delicious and I go, oh my God, this is so good. It doesn't mean I don't mean that. It means I can't believe how good this is. So in this example, when he's being asked, did you write that all yourself? And he's going, I wrote it all myself. It doesn't necessarily mean he didn't. It could mean that, but it can also mean that there's this nuance there to nobody else helped me. It's the part that we're not hearing. So it's very possible that this is disagreement to the idea that anybody would have helped him with this. I did this all by myself. Nobody helped me with this. And this is very consistent with his pride in himself. Nobody helped me. That's my statement. It's a great statement. So of course I wrote it. Nobody else helped me with this. But here's the thing with people who have narcissistic tendencies. We often think that because they believe their own versions of things, that it's harder to catch them in lies. And to a certain degree, that's true. If they've convinced themselves of something, we're not going to see that much deception. That's always possible. But if you want to get them to admit to being involved with something, if you talk about that thing positively and praise it, especially if they think it's a positive thing, 
they will gladly admit to you that they were involved with this because it makes them look good. And that's a really effective tool to get them to open up about things. And in this case, it was used very effectively. Because in a legal sense, Rob, and I want you to elaborate on this because it's not my field, but in a legal sense, he maybe shouldn't be taking full responsibility for this statement in a defamation case, where the entire accusation of defamation is found within these words. So Rob, why don't you elaborate on what happened here from a legal perspective? Yeah, so from the legal standpoint, there are certain defenses to defamation. Namely, that you didn't know the statement you were making was false, that it was a statement of opinion, that you lacked information to form the assertion that that was a factual statement or a false statement. Um, All of those kind of go out the window when the person who is accused of making the defamatory statement embraces that statement as their own. Donald J. Trump, just he just handed them at least one element of the defamation case, namely that he was the author of those words. So I just he could have put some distance between himself and that paragraph. He didn't. Let's talk a little bit about defamation because for me, as I read this, I go, okay, I look at this behaviorally as someone who is very proud, who has a grandiose sense of self, who's being accused of something and responds, you know, his his ego gets hit. And so he responds using choice, nasty words. Like he said some mean things about her book. She's really not my type. But to me, it kind of seems like a reasonable response to someone who's under fire. Is there any defense to be made for that? Or are you not allowed to say anything negative about someone in a way that will affect their livelihood. No. So you're allowed to give statements of opinion, right? Things that are not defamatory. Defamatory statement has to, it has to be something that you can prove provably false that has a certain requisite sting to it. So a provably false statement, I can't prove a statement of opinion as either factually correct or factually incorrect. For example, this book is a piece of garbage. I can't prove whether that is factually accurate or not. That's an opinion. The part of this statement that gets defamatory is that he said what she based her her statement on, her, her book, her assertion was false, right? So she went out there and publicly stated that these events transpired. That was by Donald J. Trump's statement, that was false. So he just called the entire world told the entire world that she's a liar. Got it. And she's a she's a columnist, she's a writer. You can't if you go out and say that a writer is a liar, not just the opinion, in my opinion they're a liar, but to say that some recount that they gave was false. And then to go one step further and say that they gave that false recount for for to grift, to make money off of a false statement. Well, now you've you've stepped pretty clear into lands of defamation if the statement you have made is provably false. Okay, so that's so crazy because because our professions disagree on this. Because as a lawyer, you would advise like don't say she's a liar, she made this up, because that could be defamation. Whereas the behavioral analyst, I want to see that denial. So to me, when he's going, she's lying, she made this up like to me is a plus because I'm going, there's a direct denial there. But to you as a lawyer, you're going, no, that that could just add defamation, slap defamation on top of everything. It's not the denial. I don't think the denial itself could ever serve independently as a claim for defamation, but it's the denial and then piggybacking on top of that with the whole, this person is grifting, this is all a hoax. Okay, so it's a slippery slope then because denial, okay, but going further into saying this didn't happen, she's making it up, it's a hoax, she's a nasty liar, she wrote a crummy book, that's where we're going to defamation. Yeah, every time you pile on top of that, you start getting closer and closer to defamation territory. Yeah, that's it, with the gold. I better use some Tic Tacs just in case I start kissing her. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful, I just start kissing them, it's like a magnet. I just, I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab him by the. <laughs> I can do anything. Please this let is me. very. This is very old news. Fully litigated, during debates, during everything else. Fully litigated. 
Okay. And you know what I said then, and I say it now? Locker room talk. That was locker room talk. Okay. That's what goes on. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the p You can do anything. That's what you said, correct? Well, historically, that's true with stars. It's true with stars that, that they can grab women by the p Well, that's what it's, if you look over the last million years, I guess that's been largely true. Not always, but largely true, unfortunately or fortunately. And you consider yourself uh, to be a star? I think you can say that, yeah. And now you said before, a couple of minutes ago, that this was just locker room talk. It's locker room talk. And so does that mean that you didn't really mean it? No, it's locker room talk. I don't know. It's just the way people talk. Okay. Um, I have a really important message on this one concerning objectivity and a message for the viewers that I think is really important. If you take away one thing from this video, let it be the following. To all the viewers who heavily dislike Donald Trump, don't always assume that a Donald Trump supporter supports every single thing he does. And to people who support Donald Trump, don't always assume that people who don't or dislike him dislike every single thing he does. The truth of the matter is, when we look at it that way, we're looking at the extremes. The loudest, most biased people who either blindly support him or blindly hate him. And although that exists in most normal conversations that I have, when I talk to Donald Trump supporters, they're very much open about the fact that there are things he does that are really not a great look. And when I talk about Donald Trump haters, they're very open to the fact that there are one or two things that he's done that may not be the worst. This takes me back to objectivity. Objectivity doesn't necessarily mean you can't point out the good and the bad. It just means that your opinion of someone doesn't affect your ability to look at any specific situation. So I believe that what we just saw, that discussion that we just witnessed, is objectively bad. I don't think that most sensible people, even those who support Donald Trump, can look at that and go, yeah, no, that, that's a good point you made, that, that's smart. I think most, if you don't go on the attack and say, how can you support him, he's a monster, if you just level, they will go, yeah, no, listen, I support some of the stuff he's done, but that's unacceptable. We started with something that he said, which was, I better use some Tic Tacs in case I start kissing her. Now, the way those words are said is very important to me. It's not in case we start kissing. It's not in case she starts kissing me. I would have borderline found that funny. I better use some Tic Tacs in case she just starts kissing me. Like, I'm so irresistible, she might just jump on me. It's in case I start kissing her. Like she won't have anything to say about it. Then he continues and says, I can't help myself. Or I'm a beautiful woman, I just start kissing them. And then he goes, and when you're a star, they just let you do it too. You could do anything you want. So for me, the big red flag here was that within this conversation, a very important thing is being neglected and that thing is consent. Now when he says, and they let you do it, that's a wink at consent. It's like waving to consent as it drives by. But by saying, you know, I just can't help myself. I just start kissing them. He's suggesting that he does what he wants, he takes what he wants. And he goes on to say that he believes that when you're a celebrity, you can do what you want. You can take what you want. Then in the deposition, he's given the opportunity to edit that statement, but he doesn't. He doubles down on it and he says, for a million years, that's always the way it's been. You know, stars, they could do whatever they want. Unfortunately, or fortunately. Sorry guys, listen, there's no world in which that's fortunate. Rob, am I missing something huge here? Is there any world in which that's fortunate? No, no. Whether you're a human, a lawyer, behavior analyst, I don't care, no. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't see that as something that's defendable. Objectively, I'm sorry, objectively, I don't see that as something that's defendable. Um, a few more things here with the body language before I pass it over to you. Rob, when he's asked, do you consider yourself a star? If we look at the way he answers that, he goes, uh, uh, we see a few things. This kind of bobble as his eyes open up and he looks straight in front of him and he goes, I think you could say that, yeah. And that to me is the nonverbal way of saying, duh, you know, like, duh, of course I'm a star. And again, she's doing what I said earlier, right? If she asks him, are you a star? He doesn't see the trap. 
This is an opportunity for him to gloat and say, of course I'm a star. But he doesn't see the trap that she's setting to go by admitting that he's a star, he's admitting that he can unfortunately or fortunately take whatever he wants. So again, we're talking about how people with that narcissistic behavior, you know, they're hard to catch. This is a good way to do it, right? She asks him, you're a star. He's going to take that bit. He's going, yeah, of course I'm a star. Okay, but stars get to take whatever they want. Those are your words. Now, technically, he might have a point here that he's trying to communicate and saying that, listen, I don't care what you say. This is the way it goes. Whether it's right or wrong, people in power can take the things that they want. But the underlying message here is that he comes from a mindset that consent may not be important. Or maybe he's just saying consent is implied. Like when you're that powerful, consent is just implied. You don't need it. But neither of these is a good look for him, in my opinion, as a legal defense, as, as, a, as a human defense. It's just not a great look, personally, for me. Then he's given the opportunity to kind of distance himself from that statement. And he almost, and he almost does it because he goes, it's locker room talk. And she leans on that. She goes, well, does that mean it's not true? And he goes, oh, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's just locker room talk. So we have an absence of a denial in that case. And he's just pinning it all on being locker room talk. But to me, something being locker room talk doesn't mean that you didn't mean it. There isn't him going, it was just a joke. I was joking. That's what happens in locker room talk. He's going, I don't know. It's just locker room talk. So he's almost kind of doubling down on that. So at the end of the day, Rob, I think objectively, whether you support the guy, whether you don't support the guy, you look at this footage and it's just not a good look. So I'm wondering, I'm left wondering, is it allowed to be used in court? Because almost no one is going to look at this and go, oh, well, this is clearly a really great person. So the feeling that you have, this, this not being a good look, the feeling that you have um, on the overarching character of the person that's making the statements, that is the intention of the questioning. Now, this brings me to a caveat. Every different set of circumstances, rather every different case is unique. You cannot transpose intent from one circumstance that occurred five years ago to another circumstance that occurred five years later. So intent doesn't just magically cross these boundaries. Consent. You spoke a lot about consent and the character trait of the person Donald Trump, when he's making these comments, I have a big question about how this audio and the questioning surrounding this made it into this trial. That audio clip was from an unrelated incident. And yes, it allowed you to view his statements that might suggest a character trait, but the evidentiary rules prohibit you from introducing that. You're not allowed to introduce a person's character trait when you're trying to introduce evidence of that character trait to prove that on another date, they engaged in an activity that was in conformity with that character trait. So that was the question I had when this audio clip was playing was, how did this end up making it into this trial? And it left me with a burning question of what would the argument was like in that New York district courthouse over how to clip up this deposition transcript where that remained in. So it was just a curious point. So you, you kind of already answered this, but I just want to make sure I understand. Isn't it important? Like if this speaks to his character, like this is the type of person he is, where he's saying all these things, where oh. he just takes what he wants. Doesn't it speak to the no. type of person? No. Oh. no, no. The elements for the elements for a battery is a intentional contact, intentional touching that was not consensual, right? An unwanted touching. That's it. A person's character, their moral fibers, doesn't play into whether that act did or did not occur. It's honestly just whether the act occurred. That's, that's why you start to get into this very, very slippery slope when you start to open the door into exploring the character of every single person that appears before a tribunal. The evidentiary rules exist to kind of keep those slippery slopes to the extent they can at bay. So that was, I was just curious with that. Yeah, I, I could see from a lawyer's perspective how that inquiry is very valid. Okay, so there it was. Definitely a ton of great information from Rob 
pertaining to how these depositions run and what's allowed, what's not allowed, some of the techniques and psychology that goes into that, I really appreciated a lot of that stuff. And I think overall at the end of the day, listen, I'm, I'm ready for it in the comments. There are still be people who are going to think that this was an attack or a defense, when in reality it was neither. I know it kind of seems like we're picking a lot at him, but that's how analysis works. Because he's the one that we're analyzing, we're going to take moments where there's something to talk about. So there's going to be a little bit of that element that seems like we're picking at stuff, but at the end of the day, our personal feelings about the man shouldn't play into the analysis. It's about behaviorally and legally what's happening here. I know it might be a difficult ask, but I will ask those of you at least who are regulars on the channel, let's keep the conversations in the comments polite. And keep in mind that not everyone who disagrees with us is ill-intentioned. Sometimes they just see things a little bit differently. And if we keep it civil and try to understand their points, I find most of the time we get a lot more progress than everyone just stuck in their corners going, no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong. And I think we can have just way more interesting conversations if we respect each other's point of view. Let us know in the comments what you thought and I will see you on the next one.